Let's open with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this another Lord's Day that thou hast given us. We thank you for thy word. And we thank thee for these men that thou hast raised up, one of which was Zacharias or Sinus to uh, hammer out uh, a systematic uh, and detailed um, um, system of doctrine. And we pray that thou hast cause us to understand and be able to profit therefrom. In the name of the Lord Jesus, we pray. Amen. So, we are on Lord's Day 2 of the Heidelberg Catechism. Lord's Day 1 was question, consists of questions 1 and 2. Question 1 being, what is thy only comfort in life and death? Um, question two was how many things are necessary for thee to know that thou enjoying this comfort mayest live and die happily the thing about these uh, confessions is the, the logic of them these were men who thought systematically and uh, the questions Reflect that. What, by the way, what is a, a Heidelberg? This is called the Heidelberg Heidelberg Catechism. Uh, what do we we said earlier? What are the three forms of unity? All they remember. No, in the canons, canons of Dort. The Heidelberg Catechism, the Belgian Confession, and the Canons of Dort. Now, those are the three forms of unity with respect to Reformed churches, which were the churches, Orthodox churches, on the continent, the continent of Europe. And then the Westminster Confession was the document used by England. So that's not on the continent because England, as you look at the map, and I'm not a geography buff, but uh, that ain't on the continent. So uh, that's, the, that's the document that we believe to be, I believe, more accurate. But basically they're all the same thing. What? They more extensive or exhaustive or something. Well, they had, uh, think about it. The Heidelberg was written by one man, basically. Uh, Zacharias or Sinus and uh, Olivianus with some help from Olivianus. But uh, the Westminster Confession, what? Heidelberg University. Yeah. Uh, the Westminster Confession was, how many guys were there? I forget. The Westminster Confession? About yeah. 100, 100, about 120. Yeah, there were a lot of very godly. Uh, and and so it was with Dort also. The Senate of Dort, some of the godliest men ever to, perhaps, ever since the time of the Apostles. So we do well to take heed and learn from these documents. Lord's Day 2 begins with question number 3, which is, Whence knowest thou thy misery remember the answer to question two how many things are necessary for thee to know that thou enjoying this comfort mayest live and die happily and what were they the three G's remember Tom huh? uh, grace gratitude and oh, the second two the first one is uh, the second and the third guilt grace and gratitude uh, which is exactly what they're saying there. The, the way he, they state it, the way Ursinus states it, the first, how great thy sins and miseries are. The second, how I may be delivered from all my sins and miseries. The third, how I shall express my gratitude to God for such deliverance. So then we get to question three. Whence knowest Thou thy misery. Whence? Meaning what? Huh? From from where? 
Yeah. Whence or how or uh, what are the means by which a person can know his misery? And the answer is not too sophisticated, is it? What's the answer? L. What does he say? From the law of God. Out of the law of God. <clears throat> the idea being that's an important question, obviously. Um, the law of God meaning, now we know that uh, the law is divided up into the uh, ceremonial law, the civil law, and the moral law. Now which of the three is he speaking of here? Well, you know from the answer, don't you? What's he speaking of? Maureen. Right. The moral law. Because the answer to question four tells us that. But before we get to question four, um, how is it that the law of God tells us or indicates to us our misery? And what's the answer? Chris, what would you say? I would say that because we see we can't keep it. Right. In other words, I used to, when I was teaching in Taiwan, I would put a, a, a draw, I would draw a, a ruler up on the board and uh, said if this was if this were a real ruler and somebody asked you to draw a straight line, well, without the ruler, and just say draw a straight line, I would get up to the board and I would draw a line as straight as I could. And it, it might even look completely straight until what? It might look completely straight until and put until right until you put a ruler right next to it, and then you find out not only that it's not completely straight, not only that it's not doesn't even approximate. I mean, compared to that ruler, straightness. But what? When did it become crooked? All the time. As soon as you began writing, right? As soon as you began drawing the line, it was crooked. It didn't become crooked. The whole line is crooked. How does that relate to this? See that illustration? How good that illustration is? How so? Because from the, from the beginning where yeah. this made yeah. from sin. And, that, and how did you find that out? Because somebody told you? Well, you flip him off, right? If you're a non-Christian. But a Christian says what? He doesn't find it from somebody else. Right? It's like uh, Uncle Alan. He was telling us... <laughs> What a clown. If anybody was ever born, talk about being born something, he was born a clown. He had, uh, he, he had one navy blue sock and one black sock on, and he said he was fixing to go to work, and he said, it's his word, it's his word, his word against mine. <laughs> you know, the guy said, hey, you got a navy blue sock on. No, they're two black socks. <laughs> it's not his word against your word, right? Because of what? Standard. There's an absolute standard. If, if a person came up with it, then what? If any person came up with it, then what? Well, that's your opinion, right? I've got my opinion. And when I was in Taiwan, they'd say, uh, uh, well, we believe in Buddhism. Well, okay, you believe in Buddhism. Oh, the idea being you, you believe in Christianity, we believe in Buddhism. That idea permeates Chinese culture. The idea of what? What am I talking about? Huh? Relativism. Relativism. It's relative to your culture. It's relative to your, your country. Uh, but we're speaking of... Okay, so when somebody does... When somebody does something you don't approve of, are, are, are you impatient? Are you angry? Because what they're doing um, doesn't uh, comply, doesn't comport with your culture? No, I don't think so, right? And so, 
the law of God is an absolute standard of morality. Absolute meaning what, Tom? Binary, I guess. What? Binary, binary. Binary. No. Absolute, no, it's not finite. Absolute meaning it doesn't matter who says what, right? It's tr it's true no matter what anybody says. Because it came from, yeah, it came from something outside of us. There we go again, right? Got two circles. Uh, everybody's opinion is in this circle, all right? The truth is outside. It's outside of us. And so, question four. Well, I think of the. Um, if you go back to the Westminster. Just once again, we're, we're going to point this out from time to time that these documents are so parallel. They're so similar. They teach the same thing over and over again where you go through the Ten Commandments and the very first question after you get through with the Ten Commandments is what? Calvin, you remember? Where's Calvin? Remember the first question after we finished the Ten Commandments? Is any man able, after you go through Commandment 1, what is required, what is forbidden, 2, what is required, what is forbidden, 3, what is required, what is, you get through 10. After you get to uh, what is the Ten Commandment, what is required in the Ten Commandment, what is forbidden in the Ten Commandments, and then the very next question, is any man able perfectly to keep the commandments of God? Yes, <laughs> And the answer is what? No mere man in this life. No mere man. The importance of these words, I mean, these guys were wordsmiths. Yeah, right. No mere man is able in this life. Good. That's another one. But no mere man, meaning what? Is able in this life perfectly to keep the commandments of God. Why does he say mere man? Christ was a man, but he wasn't a mere man. Is able in this life perfectly to keep perfectly to keep the commandments of God. Why is that important? He just mentioned one reason. What's another reason why the word perfectly is important? Chris. Because there's a standard. Yeah. God doesn't grade on a curve. Oh, that's close enough. Okay, Nani, uh, you, so everybody did bad on this test, and the highest grade was a 57. So we're going to give that guy, we're going to add, what's 57 plus? <laughs> 43 points to his grade, and 43 points to everybody else's grade. And James 2.10? Yeah, what does that say? James 2.10. For whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, he is guilty, guilty of all. Yeah, how do you, how big cause. Why? Because if you keep the whole law, that's whole in the mind of people. Because in the mind of God, it's not whole. It's got paint, it's tainted. Right. Yeah. He was, yeah, right. yeah. Because it is a whole. You can't separate one part Were it from the whole. It would seem as though you kept all It wouldn't be, because it is a whole. One. It's appearing. Right. Not true. What we infer from this is that the only way anybody can break so much as a single commandment is if they are by yeah. nature a, a breaker. breaker. A exactly. Breaker. Right. Yeah. They think it yeah. means if you're born, you already broke the law. We don't break some of so, them, we break the whole law. No mere man is able in this life to, perf to keep perfectly keep the commandments, but to daily break them in thought, word, and deed. And deed. We dealt with that today in the sermon, but um, the three ways that we all, even as Christians, Break the commandments are in thought, word, and deed. All right, question four. Uh, what doth the law of God require of us? And this comes from Matthew 22, 37 through 40. Read that, Tom. You got that? Matthew 22. Where's my Bible? Hey, uh, you don't get my Bible up there. Matthew 22, 37 through 40. Okay. Okay. 
And Jesus said unto them, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment, and the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. May I comment on that very briefly? You know, lately I've been studying Hebrew, and uh, it's, it's interesting here that in the Greek we have uh, love the Lord with all thy heart, all thy soul, with all thy mind. Uh, he uses those three Greek words, but Jesus himself being a Hebrew. In Hebrew, the one word lev means all of that. Lave means heart, means will, means mind. So it's, it, those are not three separate entities. You know, well, one can be on and the other off or something. Yeah, that's the old okay. light and shell. <laughs> that's the end. But it's, it's the, 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 the core, the, well, that's what heart means. Core, center, like, you know, the essence of who you are. All right. So, uh, in other words... That is telling us that, well, how is, how are the um, Ten Commandments divided? August, you remember that? They're divided into two parts, and the first part consists in which commandment? Remember? Numbers one through what? One through four are... A relationship with God, which is what he says first of all. Love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the second part is commandments 5 through 10, which teach us what? How to, how to love our neighbor. Love of God, love of neighbor. And then the last five, what? Back 25 years ago or so when they started coming out with the 30 years. This, uh, you have to love yourself first. And then and only then can you... I mean, where, where are the five commandments to deal with that? They're not there because what? Nobody has a problem with that. In fact... That probably is the problem. That, yeah, that's, your, that's the obstacle uh, causing you not to be able to love God and neighbor. Because once again, as we said earlier about the Pharisees, the Pharisees, we call, we call the Pharisees legalists, but technically they weren't legalists because a legalist would be someone who emphasizes the law. Whereas did the Pharisees keep the law? No, they set up their own law because they could... It's just like uh, people don't want to have kids nowadays... And what's the main reason? Because they're totally depraved. Not the people having kids. The kids are kids are totally. And then as soon as you mention that that a, that a child is totally depraved, they immediately object. Hey, but isn't that the reason you don't want to have them? <laughs> so uh, the reason we do not love, from a certain standpoint, and God uh, with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength nor our neighbor as ourselves is owing to the fact that we are in, inordinate. We have an inordinate love of self. This is the first and great commandment. Notice it doesn't say greatest. That's the first and great commandment. And then it says, and the second is like unto it. And what do we say? Um, is meant by that. How is the second, which is to love thy neighbor as thyself, how is that like unto the first commandment? All day. Remember? Right. The second, what's that? I didn't hear what you said. He said we can only love our neighbor insofar as we love God. Uh, in other words, 
what do we didn't we say that earlier that the, the what's the relationship between the first table of the law and the second table of the law remember that we went over that Maureen do you remember the first table is how we is our relationship with God the second table is our relationship with man right but the, this the question we're asking now it is what is the relationship between the two tables the first table is our relationship to God the second table is our relationship to man in detail but what is the relationship between are they just two different tables the first telling us how to love God the second table telling us how to love man or is there is there a an interconnected relationship between the two and what is it remember we, we, the only, first, we only keep the, uh, the, the, uh, the second table is determined by. Right. The first, the first table determines the second table, which is to say what? August, you understand that? What do we mean when we say the first table determines the second table? Do you understand? It's like he said, we can only love our neighbor insofar as much as we can love God. Right. So, a person... Think of how many problems that solves in your mind when you go out into society. If you if you have that nailed down, it it, it didn't it shouldn't surprise you too much when somebody cuts you off in traffic. <laughs> Apart from the fact that you that, that you just did that with somebody else, yeah. but that that what when these things surprise us, we're reminded of we haven't really nail down this principle. That is, you cannot expect regenerate actions out of unregenerate men. A man does not love him, love his neighbor uh, if he doesn't love God. That's why we say from time to time that um, well, uh, people, nothing is more common. What's the most common thing you hear out of people's mouths? August, what would you say? The most common statement you hear coming out of a person's mouth. What would you say? I mean, I'm, this might not be the, the answer. Taking the Lord's name in vain. Well, I would say even more common. How are you doing? Right? Here's something. You said, supermarket, right? I had a guy, Walmart, yesterday. I went to Walmart. I saw this guy. He worked at Walmart. That, that's, an, that, that's a biggie. Okay. <laughs> I, <laughs> he said that's an indictment. But I saw this guy twice in 10 minutes, and he asked me twice how I'm doing. Of course, he didn't realize he just saw me 10 minutes ago, but you follow me. So what, what does that mean? What does that statement mean? If, you, if you've got this nailed down, all right, that a person only loves his neighbor insofar as he loves God, and secondly... He doesn't love God. Then what do you know? He doesn't love you. He doesn't, and he doesn't give a flip how you're doing. All right? And if he doesn't give a flip how you're doing, then what does that statement mean? It can't be a concern for your well-being. So what is it? What is it? It has to mean something. What do we come up with, Maureen? Remember? He's, he's a good person. I'm a good person. That's, all, that's what that means. How are you doing means I'm a good person. How so, Chris? How so? Self-righteousness. I just proved it. I just proved I'm a good person. I asked you how you're doing. All right? And so that's why I say, do not go around, do not, and once a person becomes, oh, you might disagree with it. Now, this isn't written in stone, all right? This is uh, free advice. Okay. Uh, when a person becomes a Christian, that statement doesn't suddenly take a 180 degree turn. Now it means something completely different. I don't believe that. Huh? It still means the same thing, so I don't say it. I don't say, how are you doing, because how are you doing means I'm a good person. Does a Christian say that? No, we're not a person. What, what did Christ say when the rich young ruler asked him the question, good master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Tom, remember what he said? Huh? <laughs> He said, why callest thou me good? There's none good but God. What was he doing? He was, hey, they did the same thing back then. He's a good guy. 
What do you say when people, you hear that all the time too, right? Such and such a person, like they'll be talking about. You are out on, you go to a golf tournament, you hear this a lot. You say, oh, he's talking about some golfer, and, and oh, he's a good guy. Whenever somebody says that, I, I try to remember to say this. Well, I am too when I have to be. <laughs> I'm a good guy too when I have to, have to be. Of course, that's a bit of sarcasm. But so if you greet somebody, can you say something to them? Or not? Yeah. Hi, can you say hi? Is yeah. there anything wrong that with that? what it means. How are you? Same yeah. thing. <laughs> but what is how are you mean? I'm standing. These things are so, or, okay. what did Christ say? We shall give account of every idle word. And what does that mean? Words that have no meaning in your thoughts. Words that you think are not significant, but you're going to find out were very significant. Oh my goodness. Why do people say, oh my goodness, Chris? Why? Oh my goodness, I can't think of. Huh? No, but I said, why do they say, oh my, rather than, oh my, uh, oh my laptop computer, <laughs> oh my leather belt, oh my, what, oh my new car, it's significant, it, what's the reason, Chris? Because they're good, they're not going to take the name of the Lord in vain, so they think they're being good, yeah. I'm not sure. The person says, oh my goodness, because he thinks he does have goodness. <laughs> Remember when, 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 I first, when I first caught Kenneth, he doesn't say it anymore. Remember what you said when I said, your goodness. I, I said, Kenneth, I didn't know you had any. And, he, and, he, and it wasn't like he was offended, but what was it? What was, it wasn't like you were instantly irritated that I would say that. I remember clearly. What was it? You, he said it naturally, right? Remember that? You were at Chick Fil A, <laughs> at the original Chick Fil A, sure, was me. <laughs> and he said, "Oh, excuse me, I, oh my depravity." <laughs> now you're talking. So anyway, um, the first table determines the second table. A person doesn't give a flip about anybody. Else. All right, how many people are going to take that in when you say that? No unregenerate man gives a flip about anybody else. They're not, they're not going to take that. Why? Because they're totally depraved. They have, we, hey, do you have any problem with that? I don't. They'll argue in his favor. I look back at all the times, I, all the millions of times I said, how are you doing? And I know I said that because I was demonstrating. And look, I'm a good, I just proved it. I asked people how you're doing. When, when we went to Austria and we did a little study before we went, the people, like you go into a, a store, they <clears throat> greet you, you greet them, which is God's greeting. But go there, there's no God. Yeah, there <laughs> I mean, is. The I mean, one. He, uh, and that's the first thing they say. Everybody says, Grusko, Grusko, and you're just like, you, you have no idea. But we do, right, that's a good point. We do have things in our culture which indicate the, the, the flip side of the coin. In other words, indicate life before, you know, hundreds of years before goodbye means... Goodbye Bye is spelled B-Y-E, right? And you know what it means? It's a contraction meaning God be with ye. Yeah. God be with you. May God be with you. So... Anyway, the relationship between the first table and the second table is the first table determines the second table, meaning you're kidding yourself if you think you can love your neighbor without love for God, without being reconciled to God. And the relationship between the second table and the first table, if you say that the second table determines the first table, what are you? What's the name for you? You're a legalist. Yeah, I'm a good person, and so God will accept me, right? And which is every religion other than Christianity, right? They really believe that the second table determines whoever the God is, you know, that they worship. Um, 
he will accept me, like in China. The first thing they, that comes out of 98% of the people's mouths when you ask them, what's your religious persuasion? Well, all religions are the same. Because uh, all religions urge people to do good. And it, and it doesn't matter what your religion is, you just tell me what, what it requires and I'll be able to do it. Isn't, so, isn't it amazing that people go into a place to buy a car and they pick a car? But in religion... You know, they're all the same. So you go <laughs> into a dealership and say, what kind of car are you want to buy? Ah, give me any one. Well, you wouldn't do that. Well, but think about it. For the most part, and for the most, 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 they are, they are, they are correct. Apart from every other religion, but Christianity, right? all religions other than Christianity, there is a standard uh, which determines your goodness or badness and your performance in keeping that standard determines your goodness or badness. But Christianity says, so, well, let's go back to the original question. What is the relationship between the second table, Maureen, and the first? The second doesn't determine the first. The second, what? Loving our neighbor as ourselves and loving God. The relationship between the second and the first is, remember? The second manifests the first. The first determines the second. Love for God determines love for neighbor. And the second manifests, uh, if, which is to say, wh what does that mean, Tom? What do we mean when we say the second table manifests the first table? It's without having the foundation of the first one, you can't do the second. Right. And um, basically, what, what, think about this. What does reconciliation to God due to a person without which he couldn't possibly think about loving his neighbor. What does reconciliation to God do to a person? It makes him subjectively what's the word I'm looking for? Anybody? Exactly. It humbles you. Why can't a person keep the second table of the law? He's proud. He, he, he hasn't this day and he never has loved his neighbor as himself because he's proud. So, uh, the second table is a demonstration of the first table. Um, and then, canst thou keep all these things Perfectly. And that's an interesting question too, because of what? August. Or Hunter, how about you answering that? Canst thou keep all these things perfectly? Why is that a good question? All what things perfectly? First of all, canst thou keep all these things perfectly? Keep all what things? All what things perfectly? What's it talking about? What's that? We're sinners. We can't keep anything perfect. Yeah, but what is it referring to when it says, Canst thou keep all these things perfectly? Right. Law? Yeah. The, the, the Ten uh, Commandments. The first four and the, set, and the last six. Canst thou keep all these things perfectly? And, and why is that a good question? Kenneth, what would you say? I mean, they, they, this, hey, the Heidelberg and the, basically, it's the same, what did we just say after the Tenth Commandment, the, the Shorter Catechism says, is any man able perfectly to keep the commandments of God? No mere man in this life is able perfectly to keep the commandments of God, but the daily break him in thought, word, and deed. That word perfectly. Because if the answer is yes, then what? If you are, or if you were, is that good? You see that, Chris? See why that's so important? Canst thou keep all these things perfectly? Why is that an important question? Because no mere man can. 
And, and but if you could, then it would be a totally different. You're in a different ball game. And you're you're over here. Could, yeah, right. There would be overlap. If you could, then what? Then you don't need a Savior. Exactly. Right. Hey, and guess what the Armenian gospel teaches? They'll never admit it, but it's just as, I mean, I, you can, it is as clear as to the Christian. It is as clear as 2 plus 2 equals 4. They believe that every person is already saved. How so? You know where you know I'm going with that? I say the false gospel believes that everybody already is saved. How so? All right, you Does tell me. Does God die for everyone? Yeah. All right, okay. That that's one thing, but you know where I'm going. Is it the common groups that if that they, that they need to make us uh, right? If okay, do, what do they say? What's the what's the tenet of all tenets in the false gospel that they're not gonna they're not gonna get off of this? Man has a free will. All right. And what does he mean? Does he mean that you're free to go to Walmart? <laughs> and here, how are you doing two of these? Are you free to go to Walmart and buy a blue shirt as opposed to a red shirt? Is that what he means? No. no. When he says man has a free will, he means what? He means exactly the same. This is really interesting, too. He means exactly the same thing that Luther, in bondage of the will, accepted as, that, as Erasmus' explanation for it. And here's what it is. And this is what every Southern Baptist believes when he says man has a free will. He means this. Every unregenerate man is free either to believe the gospel or to reject the gospel. Equally able. Right. Every unregenerate man right, is able either to believe in Christ or to reject Christ. But if that's true, all right, if I follow the logic, if that's true that you are able as an unregenerate man to believe in Christ, then, hey, wait a second. Every, every part of the Christian life, every step of the Christian life, every portion of the Christian life is lived by, fill in the blank. First, Second Corinthians 5, 7, we walk by faith and not by sight. All right, so if a person is able, as an unregenerate man, to perform the greatest act of faith, which is what? Belief in Christ. Followed by all lesser acts of faith, of course. But the greatest act of faith is belief in Christ. If you are able, as an unregenerate man, to exercise the greatest act of righteousness, the greatest act of faith, as an unregenerate man, you're able to live the whole Christian life without being a Christian. So, they don't believe that... They believe everyone's a Christian. And so, let's use their own logic on them. They, and they'll say, oh, the conservative Southern Baptists, they say, oh, these liberals, they believe that missions in com is comprised in going overseas and telling everyone that they're already saved. Yeah, that's what they believe, basically. You're already saved. All you got to do, bow your head, close your eyes, and no one looking around, let it be known by the uplifted hand. And you're in. Because you are able, as you are, to perform that greatest act of faith. So, canst thou keep all these things perfectly? If you can't, then there's no need for Christ. And But the answer is, what does he say? In no wise, in no wise, meaning what? In no wise, meaning in no... In no stupid, opposite of in no stupid, in no, in no right, in no sense, in no way. In no way, shape, or form. Uncle William, in what sense does the word neighbor here mean? Does neighbor mean Christian neighbor, or does it mean anybody that you come in contact with? Anybody other than you. Love you, love your, any other individual. What did Christ say? What did he say when the guy asked him, who is my neighbor? He willing to justify himself asked, who is my neighbor? In other words, what? What was he basically getting at in that question? You ever thought that through? Uh, I'd like to know who it is that I don't have to love. Who can I hate? Yeah, that's basically what he was saying. And so uh, Christ gave him the... Uh, and somebody that we know uh, said that the story of the Good Samaritan is a story of common grace. <sighs> 
It was an answer to the question, who is my neighbor? And what was the answer? Whose neighbor are you? In the instance in the story, the, the, and his brings, into your brings into your life. Even if it be a, even if it be a Samaritan, right? The Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. They hated them. But listen to the answer. Can't thou keep all these things perfectly? And the answer is in no wise, in no way, shape, or form. For I am prone by nature to hate God and my neighbor. I was listening to uh, Hooksum. I, kind of, I, I had to kind of laugh at his, <laughs> his illustration of the word prone. He was going over the same question. I am prone by nature to hate God and my neighbor. And what do you think of when you think of prone? Inclined. Yeah, inclined. But that's not the way he said it. He, he, and I, kind of, I, I think he was wrong, but I, mean, I thought it was kind of comical. He, he explained it by saying prone doesn't mean just an inclination. It means if you're prone, you're lying down, he said. And so, <laughs> owing to the fact that you're lying down, you can't do anything. But I think, that, I think the word that drives the point home that he was trying to drive home with prone is the word nature. You got it? Let's just say that, let's just say that prone does mean inclined. But you're inclined by reason of same meaning. It literally yeah. mean prone literally means leaning forward. Yeah. It's the same okay, so inclined. so to say you're you're prone by nature to what? What does he say? To hate God and your neighbor. Notice he puts which one first and which one second. To hate God and thereby Therefore. to hate you. Yeah. Thereby, in so doing, to hate your neighbor. Predispose is actually one of the words that you use in the dictionary. And so, um, let me look at some of these um, scriptures that he's using. Um, yeah, look, look at Titus 3.3. 3. Read that. Is, is that Tucker sitting up there? Titus 3.3 3. Read that. For we ourselves also are sometimes foolish, disobedient, deceived, Serving wires, lusts, and pleasures, luring and malice, and, and the hateful and hating one another. Hateful and hating one another. Now, how do we know? All right, apart from scripture, you don't, of course, but. Logically speaking, how do we know that... Uh, now, he's talking... Another thing about the Heidelberg that we haven't pointed out is the questions in the Heidelberg are personal ones, meaning, uh, look at the very first question, which is, it doesn't say, what is any person's comfort in life and death? It says, what is thy comfort in life and death? How many things are necessary for you to know? See the personal nature of the questions? And so how do we know that there are no exceptions to this rule? To what rule? Whether or not you can keep all these uh, the Ten Commandments perfectly. We haven't even dealt with that, have we? The significance of the word perfectly, which is the same word that the, once again... The shorter catechism is any man able perfectly to keep the commandments of God. What? What's the import of the word perfectly? Why do we need to keep the commandments perfectly? Standard. All right. Well, why, why can't God just recognize that we're not going to be perfect? 
What's the answer to that? Because God always acts with justice. Yeah. Perfect, right. Perfect justice and what does every... That was the next question in the Short of Catechism. So the, the first question after the Ten Commandments is, is any man per, able perfectly to keep the commandments of God? No mere man in his life is able perfectly to keep but to daily break them in thought, word, and deed. Are all transgressions of the law equally heinous? So first of all, you admit nobody's able to... Okay, and then lest somebody say, well, okay, I mean, uh, nobody's perfect. So uh, any commandment... Um, what? Breaking any commandment is the same as breaking... No. Is, are all transgressions equally heinous? Some sins, uh, by reason of their nature, by some, some sins... Uh, yeah. Some sins in and of themselves are more... Uh, and by... Well, how does it say? Paul Day. Some sins... I'm drawing a blank. Roman. Some sins in themselves, right? Some sins in themselves, and by reason of several aggravations, are more heinous than the sight of God. And then, what does every sin deserve? Okay. Some sins are more heinous than others, but what does every, no matter the littleness or the bigness of its heinousness, every sin deserves God's wrath and curse, both in this life and that which is going to come, which is one of the two. Um, questions in the Shorter Catechism that totally refute common grace. How so? Remember? What does every sin... Right, you got it, Maureen. Every sin deserves God's wrath and curse both in this life and that which is to come. There's no grace in this life for right. the wicked. So... We, we read, that was last week in the Psalms, we read Psalm 92, 7, which says, When the wicked spring is a grass, and when all the workers of iniquity do flourish, it is, in the newer translations, they change that too. It says, basically it says, they will be destroyed. But the wicked, yeah, it says something like this, the new translations, the wicked flourish in this life, but, you know, when they're, they're going to end up perishing. No. When the wicked spring as the grass and when all the workers of iniquity do flourish, it is that they shall be destroyed forever. See the difference, Chris? The purpose behind it. What? What is it? It's used for their destruction. Right. And others saying, well, but unluckily they're going right. <laughs> to... They're doing good in this life, but... Oh, wow. Yeah. It's such a shame that in the next life... <laughs> no. It is that they shall be destroyed forever. NIV says, though the wicked spring up like No, don't write. No. And read it. Read it. He's going to read the NIV. NIV. Read it loud. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that though the wicked spring up like grass and all evil evildoers flourish, they will be destroyed forever. Yeah, see that? Though, the difference? Though of... they spring up like grass, well, when all is said and done, they're going to end up uh, luck, unluckily, that, no, 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 no. Psalm 73, uh, 18 says, Thou hast set them in slippery places. N-E-T Bible, I'm not sure what that stands for, but it says, When the wicked sprout up like grass and all the evildoers glisten, it is so that they may be annihilated. That's right. Well, that's the literal. I never enter there, N-E-T. <laughs> so, um, how did we get on this? Uh, oh yeah, the the the, the uh, that question that says, uh, "What does every sin deserve? Every sin deserves God's wrath and curse, both in this. Life. They're not even blessed in this life; they're cursed in this life." I mean, think about that. What, what else? What other explanation do you have? Everybody should... How often do you drive down the street and you see tombstone after tombstone after tombstone on the side of the road? And you don't notice? What am I getting at? Huh? You're checking out in about 15 or 20 minutes. It's like when I was in Taiwan, this guy that lived right next to the college, he, had, he raised pigs. And uh, I'll never... 
I'll never forget how this came, it just came home to me in such living color, sounds and smells. That every time they would come, the guy would come in this big truck and take the pigs, and they, they I mean, these were hogs. These weren't just piglets. They went, went, wasn't the pig on the Geico commercial. They, I mean, and they would... They were strong guys, too. They would take two of those guys, would roll the pig over and, and wrap his feet up. And that pig knew what was happening to him. <laughs> and he would, but you, I mean, you could hear those pigs screaming. It's not, it wasn't a squeal. Uh, I mean, they were making the, pain, the, the hideousness, the hideous, most hideous noise you could, and everything coming out of them. You know, he say, scare the, you know what, out of some, yeah, hey, that was it. And the, the, the poignant thing about the illustration is the other 12 pigs that weren't being wrapped up at that time, they were... <laughs> you guys right next to him. That ain't never going to happen to me. Right? <laughs> I'm okay. You all right? You feeling okay? Yeah. But the second they grabbed that guy, then the same noise was coming out of him and the stuff, same stuff coming out of him. I mean, hey, what an illustration. Everybody, you see what I'm saying? Drive past the tombstones. Not going to happen to me. I was, I was saying to... Uh, somebody told me that uh, the Masters... Uh, we, we, we get tickets from, pe from older people that are too old to go to the tournament. So they sell them to us. And then, of course, we resell them. But, and so every year, people that sell a number of badges, their, their clients, some of their one or two of their clients die. And so that's a good opportunity to say when somebody tells me, I had three clients die this year, so they're not going to get the badges. The Masters knows you die before you do. So that, <laughs> they ain't going to give you those badges this year because you died. Your wife's not going to pretend like you're still alive. You put him in his, in his bed, put his pillow under his head. No, no, he's dead. So anyway, the guy says, oh, two of my clients died this year, and I like to say this. Well, boy, I'm glad well, that's not gonna, never going to happen to us, aren't you? Yeah. Your clients, what was that, what was that saying? What, what, what poem was that? Never sin to know for whom the bell tolls, it tolls for thee. Who wrote that? Was it Hemingway? No. It was who? Huh? I don't know. Okay. So anyway, um, where, where were we going with this? Um, yeah, every uh, 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 man. What what does every sin deserve? Every sin deserves God's wrath and curse, both in the and why? That's the next question. Why does every sin deserve God's wrath, both in this life and that which is to come? See, here and here's the importance of we haven't even explained it. Why is it that, uh, okay, it says, what does every sin, every, he says every sin deserves God's wrath in this life. And so if God is a just God, then there can't be common grace in this life. If he deserves to be cursed in this life and God doesn't curse him, then what? God is unjust. He deserves to be cursed in this life. And what does he get in this life? Cursedness. And I'm saying, think about that. The fact that a, that a fact that a man never thinks about uh, the possibility, and even when you tell him that, hey, there's payday someday. There is a God in heaven. Never think about it. And if he thinks about it, what does he do? Immediately, he brushes the thought aside. Talk about common grace. Uh, every sin deserves God's wrath. And so why? Because every sin is a sin against what? Chris? Against God. Yeah. It's not a sin against a five-year-old kid. Imagine uh, going up to the president and spitting in his face. That would be pretty serious. But it's not a sin against the president. It's a sin against the creator of all that is. A shaking your fist in the sight of an infinitely holy God. And so... It's an infinite punishment. So question five. 
canst thou keep all these things perfectly? Answer, in no wise. For I am prone by nature to hate God and my... Far from it being said that, yeah, I broke, uh, I've broken three or four or five commandments over the past ten years. No, what? I am prone by nature to hate God and neighbor. How do we know that people really hate God? I mean, even from circumstances... Kenneth, what would you say? You mean apart from let, 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 let's say, yeah, let's say that you let's say you've been married. How many how many years have you been married? Four. Okay. Let's say he's been married for four years, and um, and I, and somebody comes up to Kenneth and he says, uh, "How's your wife doing?" And uh, Kenneth says, uh, I, "I don't know." What do you mean you don't know? Don't you live with her? I haven't, haven't lived with her for four years. I thought you were married four years ago. Yeah, I was. Yeah. <laughs> so, what's my point? How do we know people hate God? They get as far away from Him as they possibly can. I mean, when I was a kid, in our neighborhood, almost everybody went to church. Now, I don't. our, our neighbors live pretty far from us now. But when we were in... Uh, we were in uh, Lake Mary. I mean, our neighbors were right next to us. We were the only people that went to church. These guys didn't. Guys across the street didn't. Oh, no. The lady, the 90-year-old the lady uh, to the left of us went to church. She walked to church. There was a church 300 yards away. United Methodist Church. Well, no, it was a piece of USA church, which ordains women sodomites. She made it a point to go to that one, <laughs> but uh, so and, and what? Hey, but, but think about that. So, uh, so was it better then, in a sense? But what? What were the churches they went to when they went to church when I was a kid? Think about that. Okay. Most people today don't even go to a church. They stay as far, far from God as possible. But the people in my neighborhood when I was a kid who went to church, they went to. They went to church specifically to worship the devil. What do I mean? Huh? To worship a God they, they had created in their own image. Which is the God. Remember 2 second, second Timothy 2.26? What do you mean they went to church to worship the devil? That's what I mean. 2 Timothy 2.26. And that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who are taken captive by him at his will. They worship the God the devil wants them to worship, which is what? What God is that? Self. I remember my, uh, Lee Chin can remember the words, my, my brother-in-law said to one time, he's, he, he lives for making money, 24-7, man. This guy's a money-making machine. And uh, he was talking about, we talked, he was, saying what his concept of religion was. We're going to this temple, this Buddhist temple, and he said uh, that the, the, that one, uh, was it, was it a, see, you got, oh, Xiang Suo Lai, is this a, Lei Qing? Oh, it was a, Xie Da Ma. Oh, yeah, it, it, it was written on the, on the Buddhist temple itself, that the goddess, or the god, or whatever it said, said, if you, Da <coughs> what was it? He said, if, if, you, if you do evil things, this is written on the Buddhist temple, if you do evil things and you worship me, that ain't going to do you no good. And if you what? Yeah, yeah, it's, a perfect, it's a perfect religion of the world. I don't care what culture you live in, what country you live in. If you put, do bad things and worship me, it ain't going to do you no good. And if... You're a good person and don't do bad things. What are you coming to me for? <laughs> Got it? <laughs> and now that's logic. That's the logic of the world. Yeah. So they... What's that? Then why would they go in there? I don't think... <laughs> They're not logical. They're not logical. <laughs> hey, what do the Southern Baptists go to church for? They're worshiping themselves. Do it at home. 
get to dress up and go somewhere. You watch, <laughs> right? Watch Ernest testimony time. <laughs> because it, I mean, it is the most, and I remember so clearly uh, Sunday school class opening exercises. Uh, Charlie wrote in his prayer every single Sunday, he ended his prayer thusly. And we'll be careful to give thee all the praise and honor and glory in Jesus' name. No, they were extremely careful to give themselves all the praise and honor and glory. How so? Huh? They didn't believe in total depravity, which means what? The difference between heaven and hell is your will. They didn't believe, uh, they didn't believe that, that, that God loves uh, the elect and the elect alone. Uh, they believed the difference between heaven and hell was their will. They didn't believe that Christ uh, procured the salvation of all the Father gave him. They believed that what? Huh? Individuals Christ did what he did, did just as much for those who end up in hell as for those who make it to heaven. And so what's the difference between heaven and hell, Chris? Yeah, it's not what he did, it's what you do with what he did. And then they believe that faith precedes regeneration. And what does that say, Chris? That you made the decision first and you grabbed right. the faith. And then yeah. He did what he did owing to your doing something that you did. He regenerated you on the basis of something that you did. See that? They were careful to give themselves all the praise for everything. That's the religion of the false god. So, the last question is, canst thou keep all these things perfectly? Which is your responsibility in no wise? Next week, we're going to deal with Lord's Day 3, which is, did God then create man so wicked and perverse? Right. Did we start off like this? Or did something happen to bring us to this point? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank Thee for this another Lord's Day. We thank Thee for these pivotal, pivotal and key questions that we all must come to grips with. We thank Thee for the Lord Jesus Christ who saved us because we, by nature, violate the first table of the law and by nature violate the second table of the law. And thou hast saved us and called us with an holy calling, not according to our works, but according to thine own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. In the name of the Lord Jesus, we pray. Amen.